Warriors and Valkyries, take a hot bath in the blood of your enemies. Enjoy a lovely cup of tea, brewed in the skulls of your detractors, and enjoy a quiet symphony composed of the lamentations of those who opposed you. Because it's time to talk tall to me. <laughs> you just scream and then I'll auto tune it to fit the beret song. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Welcome back. I am Omen Sade. And I am Nick McGill. And this is Talk Tall to Me, a vengeance-fueled rampage through the smoking battlefield, which is the history of prog rock. Every enemy battalion an album, every dispatched soldier a song. Nick and I, swords ablaze, will trudge onward and onward, until we are covered from head to toe with the dreadful awful that is the music of Jethro Tull. I will be waiting with a tarp, a hot towel, and a <laughs> bottle of yoo and we'll get through this. <laughs> I think I've got some roots to branches in my hair. <laughs> I, I got nothing. Omen. Yes, Nick. This week, before yes. before we dive into the actual song itself... Okay. Which, which is? The song to which we are listening this week is Only Solitaire off the B-side of War Child. I, the name would have sufficed. Before we get into that <laughs> track, we are going to get into some reviews. Not reviews of Talk Tall to Me, because we know those are all just beaming. That's right. What are we going to review, or what are we going to hear reviewed this week, Omen. Well, Nick, as promised, we are going to be bringing our traditional fare to the to the feast that we have laid out today, which is the Rolling Stones review for this album. That's right. And and we we were saving it for this episode in particular because this song has is is so so interwoven with with reviews and with critics which which we'll get into so we will we will get into the rolling stones review for this album are you ready nick oh i'm i'm so very ready december 9th 1974 5 a.m eastern standard time oh an hour later than usual you know the 70s man everybody was, was just free <laughs> just love and- tired <laughs> Got, got my friend stuck in the door. <laughs> War Child, review by Jim Miller. Oh, this, this wasn't the last one, right? This one's completely new. Yeah, they're dropping like they're dropping like bassists, Nick. Dro- That's a shame. Okay, go on. Ian Anderson, the guru and master musician behind Jethro Tull, had a good thing going. Ian would play the Pied Piper with his flute dance about and dangle a leg while his band ambled through snatches of convoluted but impressive jazz slash tall, sorry, jazz slash rock jamming. (sighs) Jethro Tull, which had begun life modestly as a group specializing in fluted pop with some (laughs) classical pizzazz, became instead a didactic warhorse, a vehicle for Ian's obtuse sermons a launching pad for ambitious messes of noodling like last year's A Passion Play. Such stuff didn't didn't sell well. Even avid fans found A Passion Play boring. To recoup his losses, Anderson has now returned with War Child, an LP of relatively brief songs, some of them within the four-minute mark. (laughs) Is that is that the one the one the one sentence you can find that's positive out of <laughs> uh, pretty pretty much yeah <laughs> each handcrafted track comes chock full of schmaltz strings tutti frutti sound effects and <laughs> and flute toots to boot not to mention Anderson's warbling lyricism. British audiences have long had the good taste to avoid such pablum, 
Hopefully, American listeners, hipped by a passion play, will follow suit. Remember, tall rhymes with dull. That is, that line is just as pablum as anything tall has written. First of all, yes, it's the it's the pablum calling the 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 pablum poo. Yeah, the, that was that was terrible. That that's the review, Nick. That's it. That's all we have from uh, from Jim Miller. It was pleasantly pleasantly banal. It was it was what I've come to expect in terms of reviews for Tull. In terms of its negativity. Yeah, yeah. But not in terms of its length. But I, and that's that that was the next part is I was going to say is that it's it's kind of a treat that it's not verbose and short. Yeah, I think uh, Jim Miller finally took the advice of Shakespeare, who once said, "Brevity is the soul of wit," which reminds me of another thing. That was... Oh, ha! Huh. No, I get it. Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So, Nick, do we have any any other business? to which we must attend before we dive into the song. That we do not. Let us go right into this bad boy. This It's a quick little snippet. I think we can bounce right into Only Solitaire. Let's see what tutti fruity sound effects await us. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> on, on this track. Well, Nick, there we have it. There is that that little that little tidbit right there. That's you know, I didn't hear any tutti frutti sound effects. I heard predominantly acoustic guitar. Yeah, no flute even. Nope, no no flute no flute toots to boot. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, this is one of those Jethro Tull songs, which is apparently just Ian Anderson. Yeah. Yeah, I think little, I think you might be right there. Little double track guitar, mm-hmm. acoustic, little mm-hmm. little double voice, and, mm-hmm. and voila. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just it's very reminiscent of mm-hmm. Aqualung, the the couple of acoustic ditties from Aqualung. And you know what it you know what it shares with those ditties, aside from. The acoustic guitar and Ian Anderson. Aside from the acoustic guitar and Ian Anderson, yeah. <laughs> then I don't know. <laughs> uh, a sense in my mind of of honesty and a sense of uh, mm. gen genuinicity. Gen- genuine, gen gen genuity, gen- genuity. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-hmm. No, I don't like it. But you know, it's very grounded. It's very it's very straightforward, and yeah. it sounds very. Even though it's a critique of a critique. It's a counter a counter critique. It's very heartfelt. It is. It is. It's it's a lot of it's a boiled down version of what we've been saying, I think, a, a lot on this album thus far, is that it it's more it feels more genuine. It feels more more simplified and there's more emotion behind it. And and usually it is the character of it, it it's not a character it's usually it's ian singing and not a, a character that ian is in the guise of and i think right totally seeing that consistent consistently makes it more make it kind of like it it, build, it builds up it adds up if we see him genuine in four songs in a row i think it means something more than first i'm aqualung and then i'm i'm cross-eyed mary and then i'm whatever right and you know i think what's what's so fascinating about this is that he seems to be not only not performing a character he seems to be standing outside of the character that he performs yeah and looking looking in at it which is really great i mean it's it, you know i feel like so few maybe i'm wrong about this but i feel like that's not a very common stance in in lyricism in rock and roll it's it's very 
it's a very meta song. It's it's one it's those songs that that every now and then not it doesn't happen terribly frequently in in Tull, but we we have heard it in Tull. Every now and then the singer's like, "Yeah, we're the band and we're doing this for you, the listeners." You know, there's there's an acknowledgement of of I I am a I'm a human being and I'm doing something and you're listening to me talk about that. But I feel like that's usually within the character that the band is portraying. Mm, okay. Rather than okay. rather than somebody stepping outside of it and being like, I see, you know, I I, I see that this is what I'm doing. And and look at that, isn't that interesting? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I suppose that in some sense that helps separate the 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 human from the the facade that is the the flute player you know yeah so okay i get that i flute facade is actually the the name of my my first autobiography that's and i mean your mom bought all of the copies she bought I, both of the copies. I tried to get one from her, and she just wouldn't. She no, 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 no. She kept one in the original wrapping and had you sign the other, and I just I couldn't get. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nick, is there anything else that we want to talk about musically with this? I I, I just want to express how freaking amazing a guitarist Ian is. I feel like this is better mm. than Aqualung. Yeah, better than his playing on Aqualung. I think really the if we're not talking. If we're not talking acoustic guitar for this, I don't know what we would talk about because it's it's a a that's all there is <laughs> musically. But two, like it's just really beautiful. It's really genuinely beautiful. There's a lot more flourish there. There's a lot more flower there. There's more substance than what we've heard in his previous yeah. acoustic tracks. And that's that's not to put down the previous stuff because I do like a really simple acoustic. But it's really nice to see that that his chops have have improved. Whether he could have done this four four albums ago or not, we're just seeing it now. I think he's I think he's just evolved. I think that you know every album he becomes a better musician, and it's really it's really exciting to hear on that on that level. Mm -hmm. You know, the first I listened actually to this song twice before you know once just now, and once before we started recording and. After I listened to it the first time, I was like, oh, yeah, and that part where the strings come in. Because it has that sense of, like, that ebb and flow and that richness to it that mm-hmm. he manages to do with just probably two guitar tracks. It's really cool. Yeah. Right? And that's 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 that, that level of depth that he really, really pulls off successfully. Yeah. There's, yeah, it's it is so layered. There's something, like, not... I want to say held back, but that's not exactly what I mean. Something relaxed about this. He's like playing really, really mm-hmm. well, but he's not showing off at the same time. Yeah, it's it's very, I'm just going to sit here and noodle and, oh, I just happen to be recording. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't know this <laughs> Holiday Inn in Idaho <laughs> had a f- recording <laughs> studio in it. How fortunate. Oh, oh, you're here listening? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. Maybe I'll go down to the Motel 8 bar. Have an orange juice. Bad idea. (laughs) Have an orange juice. Oddly specific. So lyrically, lyrically, we've only got a handful of lines in comparison to, to what we're accustomed to. And it's all, while, while delivered in this sweet, almost saccharine package it is very biting right it's very bitter so i think that even even the most soft skulled tullite amongst us which which it's my turn to be this this week would easily jump to the conclusion that it is a a song in response to some critique or review that that jethro tull received Yes. And they would be right. <laughs> and even and even, you know, even if you didn't get it from the rest of the song, I think the 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 line the critics falling over to tell themselves he's boring 
The critics falling over to tell themselves he's boring and really not an awful lot of fun. Really delivers it. Yeah. Right, and that's only the third line. You know, that's that's right. there's no <laughs> right, exactly. There's not a lot of preamble here. No. No, he's basically saying this is what all the critics have said. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's some of it I I imagine is fact that he's he had seen it and heard it and read it before and some of it's probably like taken to the extreme of of oh oh what else can they say about me? Oh, you're going to hear this next. You know what it reminds me of, Nick? What's that? Your friend and mine, Taylor Swift. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does haters what's the, haters going to hate. Oh, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. What's the what's the the line? I stay out too late. Dum, 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 dum. Go on too many dates. Dum, 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 dum. And that's what people say. Boom, boom, boom. But that's what people say. Yeah. That's the bit that it reminds me of. I wonder if she got the idea from More Child. I can only logically that attribute that. Taylor Swift has like a dank wine cellar full of Jethro Tull LPs. I hope it's not dank. They will not survive well down there. I now, Nick, you know full well that I don't mean dank in the traditional usage of the word. I mean like dank, like, like good, like like rich, like dope, like dope. Yes. Yeah. Then yes, that that she probably has a tall room. Because tune in to our other podcast, Negotiate Neologisms to Me, where we discuss <laughs> all of the trending talk from, from the past week. I I just I think we should end it there with with Taylor Swift and and yeah. carry on to the rest of the song. <laughs> oh yes. So yeah, so here we have. I mean, what what. I, it, yeah. Let's pull out some of the specific lines that are that are sort of interesting and that refer to things that we that we know about. Court jesting, never resting. Court jesting, never resting. He dresses a court jester, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. We we've we've discussed that in the past. The pumpkin pants, the the puffy shoulders, the cod piece, etc. That was oh, the cod piece. Yes. Well, that was probably right around now, wasn't it? He he, he absolutely. He got out of the the trench coat phase probably right around Aqualung. Yeah, I think then so. Then went into probably album specific getups for thick as a brick and passion play i'm assuming some sort of theme there yeah and this is where we start to see the that crazy getup in fact i believe on the back of the vinyl is him in like one of his one of his big cod pieces he's got he's got a, he's holding like a giant staff with an eagle on top oh my gosh i think that's on the back of that yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and then and, and of course it goes on into minstrel and and songs from the wood and what have you. But yeah, so so court jesting, his jumping in the air. Yes. His lame brain dances and his jumping in the air. He was very active. He was very very active with the flute while playing the flute and not like he he bounced all over the stage and even when we saw him in concert he tried to be it was like yeah okay yeah grandpa go 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 fetch that balloon the the spirit was willing but yeah. the flesh was the, the flesh unable 
the flesh had been on the road for a lot of years so, there. So many years. Probably the, the ligaments were a little sore. Yeah. You know, my favorite line of all this. Is it the one about venereal disease? Yes. How did you know? <laughs> I Nick? mean, just, just bring, you know brings me so it back well. home, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Well, who the hell can he be when he's never had VD and he doesn't even sit on toilet seats? Well, who the hell can he be when he's never had VD and he doesn't even sit on toilet seats? I just think that the rhyme scheme is so clever. I mean, actually, the rhyme scheme of the whole thing is really a lot of fun. Yes, it's nice. It's very nice. But that one always stood out to me. And it reminds me, you know, it, it reminds me of a song that we haven't gotten to yet, Too Old to Rock and Roll. Mm. Mm-hmm. The old rocker wore his wore his trousers, his pants too long? No, the old rocker, something, something, drank his ale too light. The old rocker wore his hair too long Wore his trousers too tight Unfashionable to the end Drank his ale too light you know, there's always this, I feel like there's this self-perception that Ian has that other people don't think of him as a real rock star because he doesn't do the things that other rock stars do. Right. That 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 specific line, the VD one, is the one that I think he takes to the extreme and says, oh, what are they going to say next? Yeah, you know? I think so. That I can't. I can't imagine some some critic somewhere had had actually said that. No, no. So, but I mean, w- when you contrast Jethro Tull with other bands that put out albums in 1974, the Rolling Stones was one of them, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. who were famously sexual and oh, drug yeah. doing. You know, so if you if you put if you put the Rolling Stones up against Jethro Tull. Jethro Tull looked like a bunch of schoolboys on their on their way to their lessons. Yeah, yeah. They they had equal parts pageantry, but but the pageantry of Tull was like nerdy Renfair kids, and the pageantry yeah. of of the Stones was like like tight leather jeans and no shirt. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Also, we have uh, Tom Waits released "The Heart of Saturday Night." Oh wow! Okay, one of one of his first. It's an early album for him, I believe. Right, his second album. Second. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. That's a good, solid one. And he, you know, he his a lot of his character is based around this, you know, hard, hard living, heavy drinking, heavy smoking, kind of drifter. Right. So he, so he 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 had a character himself. Yeah. Right. Eric Clapton released an album mm, that year. Okay. At that point, he was so low, I believe. I think he was just clapped in. Uh, yes. Steely Dan. Okay. Yeah. All, yeah, I mean, I don't think Tull was terribly rare in that they put out an album a year. I think most people generally tried to stick to that. They were certainly much more prolific then than, than a lot of musicians are now, it seems. Oh, absolutely. Look at L... M A F O. They put out two albums and then they dipped. Party yeah. Rock and then Sorry for Party Rocking. <laughs> is that is that their is that the name of their second the, album? Yes. <laughs> so that was their goodbye album. Yeah. They were apparently. like like listen guys, we just we di- we went too hard Wait. and and we we actually don't encourage this lifestyle because we we have been in we want to tell you that Party Rock is no longer in the house tonight. <laughs> Not, in fact, if if you could avoid it at all costs, it would probably behoove you. I loved, I loved that those songs. No, I, I knew, I know you did.
Everybody's in the house tonight. Everybody just have a good time. Yeah. And we gon' make you lose your mind. Woo. Everybody just have a good time. Clap. Party Rock is in the house tonight. Oh. Everybody just have a good time. I can feel it. And hey. we gon' make you lose your mind. Yeah. We just wanna see you. Sorry for party rocking. So, Nick, let's talk about one more lyric from Only Solitaire. Yes. And it's, and it's the final, the final couple. Yes, I think that's, I think, I think if we talk about anything about this song in relation to the critics, it, it's this one. It has to be. Yes. And so it must be all a game of chess he's playing. But you're wrong, Steve. You see? It's only solitaire. And so it must be all a game But you're wrong, Steve. You're wrong, Steve. You see, it's only solitaire. Now, before we get into who Steve is, let's break the break down the distinction between chess and solitaire. What do you right. What do you make of that, Nick? Well, I just uh, let's let's point out that the "but you're wrong, Steve." You see, it's only solitaire is spoken by Ian. Yeah, it's, absolutely, it's not yes. it's not sung lyrically it is spoken directly by yep. Ian so chess ch- there's there is strategy to chess there is I would say a certain level of pageantry to chess you are mm. interacting with someone you are yeah. feeding off of someone you are there is a a a conflict right in some sense yeah. As much as you're playing the pieces, you're really playing your opponent. Yeah. Yeah. Of 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 any game, chess is, is like up there on that list. Yeah. Right. And solitaire is a single person game. What you do to pass the time, you can you could probably be asleep and play it. Like there's there's it's not intellectually stimulating. It is simplistic. Yeah, it's really just sorting things by number. It's it's yeah. like it's organizing for cards. Yeah. So Nick, is what is is Ian saying that <laughs> that while his critics think that they are kind of battling him, that in fact they're not even sitting at the same table? I guess is he saying that what is I initially took it to mean that what what Tull is doing, what Ian is doing, is solitaire. But now that I think about it, I think he's saying what the critics are doing is solitaire. Mm, They're the ones playing solitaire. It's substanceless. It has no point. There's there's no connection. I think that's more of a jab than him saying I'm I'm playing solitaire because I don't think Tull's playing solitaire. He Tull Tull is is creating music for the people who love Tull, you know, and that's not a one sided thing. I think you know I I I agree with your assessment from like an emotional level, but but it's just the grammar that tri- that trips me up because the critic says. And so it must be all a game of chess is played. But you're wrong, Steve. It's only solitaire. So is it? So I feel like he's he as the critic voice is saying Jethro Tull is playing this, or Ian yes. is playing this incredible chess game, and Ian says, "No, no, it's not chess. It's solitaire." Yeah, but I I think it can be implied that that no, no, we're not playing chess. The only game being played is solitaire. So it's not no we're not playing chess we're playing solitaire the the only game that here is solitaire and guess who's doing it interesting yeah now it does also especially with the fact that with the instrumentation and crew on this song it kind of does feed into a theme that we've <laughs> okay. talked about before that that Ian you know is the loneliest man alive yeah i i forgot about that and that that does not help my side of the argument that well, he's the only one playing this song, <laughs> which is hilarious. It's interesting. I mean, I just find that I just find the distinction between those two games really, really delightful. And I, you know, I think it's hard to put our finger on exactly, exactly, you know, 
word for word what it means, but I think that we mm-hmm. know what it means I th- emotionally. And, and I think I don't I don't hate the idea that it it could be somewhat open to interpretation. Yeah, you know, it could it could maybe go either way. I just I'm. To me, Ian saying, oh, no, we're not, we're not playing chess. We're playing solitaire. It's not – that's not a, a – that's not a, a, a shot at Rolling Stone saying, oh, yeah, but – or Steve. It's not a shot at Steve saying, oh, no, we're playing solitaire. That sounds like – wouldn't you rather be playing chess? Like how are you sticking it to the guy by saying, oh, we're actually only playing solitaire? Well, it reminds me of – you're familiar, of course, with Avatar The Last Airbender. I believe I am, as I'm your I'm your avatar granddaddy. No, your avatar papa. Wow, yes. So you know the episode where Azula takes over Ba Sing Se, and there's the moment when she and Long Fang are facing off, and Long Fang is like, well, you know, these royal guards are going to be loyal to me, obviously. And she was like, mm, I don't think that they will be. And eventually he like, he folds and he's like, you have beaten me at my own game. And she says, oh, please, you weren't even a contender. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. That's what it reminds me of. Okay. I feel like I feel like the critics are saying like, oh, Ian's so clever because he's playing this amazing chess game. And Ian's like, are you kidding? I'm not even, I'm playing a game that is completely aside from you so so the chess game is between tull and the critics then i think so oh okay so now it makes sense yeah okay i'll give you that now it definitely makes much more sense that way just a little avatar reference clears everything up uh, as that's all it takes as always that's all it takes now on to the question of who is this mysterious Steve? steve did ian pick a random person out of the phone book while he was on a bus in the middle of Georgia? I guess we'll never know. <laughs> Come back next week. No, so actually, it apparently refers to a specific review written by Mr. Steve Peacock. You know him. You love him. Stevie <laughs> Peacock. Sounds Stevie like a children's Pe- show host. Steve Peacock. Hi, boys and girls. Are you ready to play a game of chess with Uncle Peacock? <laughs> oh, we, I took your pawn. We can't play with Ian today. He's playing solitaire. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, would you like to hear the review that is the direct, the direct um, impetus for this song? I would, I would love to. the the pro, The progenitor. No, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, the impetus. Yeah, the, <laughs> Inspiration. H- hilariously, it's much longer than the actual song itself. So I will I will read excerpts from. Yes. Do we know what 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 inspired this this review? It apparently so so it was written on March eleventh, nineteen seventy two, which I oh, believe 72. coincides with the touring, and it refers to a live show or several okay. live shows that that Mr. Peacock attended, and I so, and I think at that time. They were touring. Had to have been thick, as a brick. thick, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Or thick mixed. Hang on, let me just see when thick actually came out. Oh, it it was released March third of seventy two. So, so he must have been on one of the first concerts, been at one of the first yeah. thick concerts. Yeah. Or maybe it was some of the stuff from. Well, anyway, let's hear the review. Yes. March 11th, 1972, Jethro's Hollow Threat. One of the most disillusioning experiences of my musical life occurred when I saw Jethro Tull for the second time. It was three weeks after the first time when I'd really enjoyed them a lot. They were musically strong, and Ian Anderson had a fine stage presence, cracking lots of little comments and asides. I took it for a clever, spontaneous performance. Then I saw them again. And everything was exactly the same. Mm. Practically every note of the music, bar the goofs, and all the jokes and asides, 
I can't help feeling that someone who has his ad libs rehearsed that carefully needs watching a little carefully. And I've been a little wary of Jethro Tull ever since, especially when I found successive albums breaking little new ground and doing little more than refining down and adjusting slightly a concept stated on the first album. Ian Anderson has borrowed and created his own cliches and stays with them even on the new album. He goes on to talk about some of the band members. I get the feeling that the band is being used as an effects box, as sidemen to a central idea that isn't really strong enough to justify its role. I... They... I don't want to agree with him. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he's nearly as out of bounds as like Ben Gerson was. Do you want to hear an, another little little tidbit? We'll finish it off. Yeah, 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 yeah. The central idea is Ian Anderson's new monster work, Thick as a Brick, a long, related sequence of songs which reflects a bitter, cynical view of the world around him and the people who run it. Businessmen, the church, schools, you know the things. That, obviously, is a vast oversimplification of the work, but I think Ian Anderson, too, is guilty of oversimplification. Somehow, Thick as a Brick sounds to me like a bit of an empty gesture, a hollow threat. There's nothing in there that hasn't been said before, though he does put it quite well. I don't find much in there to jolt me, to catch my imagination. Maybe these things need saying over and over again, but does it really need a whole album to say it? I think not, but doubtless thousands will disagree. Steve Peacock. The thing that strikes me about this, Nick, is that on the whole, it's not that negative a review. It's not. It's but not. But the thing that... The thing that I do find a bit ridiculous about it is that he's like, <laughs> these entertainers who are professional musicians seem to have rehearsed too much. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, he was. the The main complaint was was that once you see one tall show, you've you've seen them all, and and honestly, like, I I get that. Yeah, I think that's a valid point, but but also I feel like there are different rock and roll bands. I mean, if you go to a if you go to an Ozzy Osbourne concert, is that is that a musician who fits this parallel? Then you might, you know, find crazy things happening, biting the heads off bats and whatnot. At, at that era, yeah. And you you know you you never know what might happen. Somebody might set a guitar on fire. Somebody might mosh in a pit. I don't. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Is this pit reserved for moshing? I I, Can I, I have, mosh here. I have brought my moshing vestments. <laughs> and you know his complaint is that they they're consistent. I, I just I have a hard time. I have a hard time seeing the validity of that as a critique. And maybe that's my theater background showing where consistency is sort of the goal in in a lot of cases. Well, there there is a semblance of 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 the off the cuff banter that you you are led to believe if you see them once every three or five years, whatever, is is off the cuff banter. You, right. It's and it's a bit jarring to see that it's 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 go to, it's stock dialogue that is, is essentially acted. I, I get that. I yeah. understand that. I but do. I, but but I, yeah. they tall tours every single day. I know. It's like 300 performances a, a year. Yes. So at this so, point, uh, Ian's on his thousandth performance or more? Absolutely. 1500th performance, perhaps? Yeah. So I can't blame Ian either. I, and, you know, I think the reason that Ian was obviously so pissed off off about this enough so that he wrote a specific song retaliating toward it mm -hmm. is that it, it, it seems like a very personal attack and yeah and, and for yeah. me it's that you know Steve Peacock doesn't like the kind of person that Ian Anderson is which is somebody who knows what works in front of a crowd and executes it in a way that he knows is going to work I mean he's yeah. not Led Zeppelin he's not the Rolling Stones He's not some drugged out, you know, super spontaneous person. Yeah. Yeah. He's, it's, I mean, he's, it's, 
It's also a testament to what has made Tull last so long. He knows what works and he can do it well. And he can do it consistently enough without hurting himself. Like that's the other thing. That's like, you know, when you talk about repeatability in theater, part of the way, part of the reason for that is safety. Yeah. Right. And you know, the the more consistently that the more consistently that you do something, the more durationally you can do it. Yeah. If you're improvising every single night, unless you are, you know, one of these kind of geniuses who really does have that ability to be super in the moment all the time and to just sort of be a, a genius of of comedy, then it's it's really hard to like produce that consistently. Yeah. It's a matter of control. Exactly. Yeah. And and the nice Scottish boy who grew up in Blackpool is not, you know, and was never expected to be, I feel like, some kind of comic improv genius. Yeah. Yeah, I again I, I understand where where is Steve is coming from, but you, it's not like you, you were handed a playbill saying a night of spontaneous entertainment with Jethro Tull, you know, you, you, right. you went there with those preconceived notions. Exactly. And that's on you. And he does admit that it's all well done. True. I mean, he does give him that. Yeah. I wonder if at this point the expectation came from knowing that the band had a history in jazz, which does have mm. a tr heavy tradition of improvisation. Right. And and we've seen those bits and bobs that have been, quote unquote, improvisation in Tull that that become by rote memorization after a while. It's the same Absolutely. thing, whether it's Martin's guitar solo in Aqualung or or. Ian's banter just after Martin's guitar solo in Aqualung. <laughs> right. It's it's a show. It's a show, dude. Exactly. And I think, you know, any of those spontaneous bands that put on, quote unquote, a different show every night are also rehearsed. Like, it's also an act. Yeah. It's just that maybe yeah. some people are better at covering it and maybe change up their material more often. Right. Un unless you genuinely get a group of insanely well-trained improv improvisers right but who then it's hard happen to be in a band <laughs> right <laughs> you know? then it's it's hard to keep them off the cocaine isn't it that oof yep 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 yeah it's the lead of of rolling stones mick jagger yeah i think it was jagger who at a concert one time in the late 70s or early 80s he got a, a, a school kid handed him a book to autograph and and Mick Jagger took it, and it was a chemistry book. And as he was signing it, he was like, oh, chemistry. I used to be a chemistry lab myself. Is that is that it? That's it, because he because of the drugs, Nick. Oh. Oh, so he's saying he, he fell into drugs and then got into rock and roll instead of staying into chemistry. No, I, I think he's I think he was just saying, like, oh, yeah, chemistry, haha, <laughs> drugs. Oh, Mm. Not whatever, funny times I'll, here. Funny times. Outcome, <laughs> Mick. Not not a good not a good one. <laughs> good good jokes to be had here on Talk Tall to Me. And so it must be all a game of chess is played. But you're wrong, Steve. Steve. You see, it's only solitaire. So, what are we talking about next week, Omen? Literally, no clue. Let me look at the album. <laughs> I, I could I could tell you. No, no, no. Next week, we have the pleasure of talking to all about the third hurrah. Until next week, why don't you stop playing solitaire on your computer, mm. scoot on over to Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. leave us a rating of five stars and a review that's just north of quality from Steve Peacock's. You know, just a little bit nicer than Stevie's. Ian Anderson may not sit on toilet seats, but if you find that you are, use that time to go over to your pod catcher of choice, leave us a good review, and send us five stars. While you do that, we'll be waiting for you. I'm Nick McGill. I am Omen Said. We are Feckless Momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me.
The Betrayal of Talk Tall to Me by Steve Gerson. One of the most disillusioning experiences I've ever had listening to podcasts was the second episode of Talk Tall to Me that I listened to. When I first started listening to it, I thought that it was just an editing error or a mistake or something at how bad it was. And then I listened to it, to it again, and then I just realized it was terrible. My main complaint is that I thought they had different hosts every week, but it seems that Omen Said and Nick McGill are the only people who ever talk tell to me. I'm not sure who hired them as hosts, but they would should probably go back to their other job. If only they had another job. Every episode sounds like blah, 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 Ian is Scottish, blah, 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 Blackpool, blah, 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 I love Martin Lancelot Barr so much I want to marry him. I don't know who signs the paychecks over at the Feckless Moms Audio Network, but they really should purge their books and get rid of Talk Tall to Me. The most offensive thing about Talk Tall to Me is that it is a proud member of the Feckless Moms Audio Network.